I, Mayor Matt Girding, call the January 24th, 2024 City Council meeting of the City of Summers Worth to order. Kirk will call the roll. Councillor Pepin. Yep. Vincent. Here. Gibson. Excused. Oh, excused. My apologies. Parody Catanzaro. Here. Misho. Here. Witham. Here. Goodwin. Here. Cameron. Here. Messier. Here. Councillor Vincent will lead the council in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, next on the agenda is the recognition of our indigenous people, our native ancestral Americans. Uh, this meeting takes place on Indakina, excuse me, which is the unceded traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook and Wabanaki people, past and present. Uh, we acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land, waterways, living beings of the Alnabuk, uh, the people who have stewarded Indakina throughout the generations. Uh, next is agenda item four, which is scheduled public hearings. There are none tonight. Uh, next up, we have agenda item five, which is comments by visitors. Uh, Summersworth City Council and Mayor's Office welcome all visitors and encourage you to voice your opinions and views at council meetings. Uh, in accordance with Council Rule 7C, uh, a time limit of five minutes per person shall be in effect unless the council wishes to suspend the rules. Speakers shall not enter into a debate with any person, the mayor, council members, city manager, or department heads. Is there anyone who wishes to speak tonight? All right, anyone who wishes to speak? All right, seeing that there are none, we will go on to agenda item six, which is the approval of the consent calendar. Uh, the chair will obtain a motion to approve the consent calendar, which includes the minutes of the city council meeting held on January 8th, 2024, as well as a letter of re resignation from alternate member of the planning board, Paul Goodwin. Do I have a motion? I see a motion from uh, Councillor uh, Cameron. Uh, Councillor Cameron moves that the consent calendar be approved as presented. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Pepin. Question before the council is the adoption of the consent calendar. All those in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. All right, the uh, ayes appear to have it, the ayes have it, and the consent calendar is adopted. That moves us to agenda item seven, which is comments by city councilors. Are there any comments this evening from city councilors? Councilor Witham, start us off. Thank you. I guess with some degree of trepidation, I wanna offer a few comments about the Willand Warming Center, the homeless warming center on Willand Drive. I think just to make sure that we're all on the same page, including members of the public either here or watching at home. The Willand Warming Center has been in operation now for uh, a number of years. Uh, typically, the driver of what happens at the Willand Warming Center are the cities of Dover, Rochester, and Summersworth. <coughs> in fact, those three communities uh, are the primary uh, funders uh, of uh, the services that have uh, that have and continue to be provided there. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, we're at like a twenty-five thousand dollar mark here in Summersworth, or is it fifty? Fifteen. Uh, but we also provide the in-kind services. Thank you, and that's part of my comment here this evening. Uh, to be clear, uh, the people that find themselves in need of housing. Uh, this time of year, uh, particularly during these cold nights, uh, need those services. Uh, there's no question about it. And uh, people find their need for those services because of a variety of life circumstances, uh, whether that be financial, whether that be health, whether that be substance abuse, misuse, uh, and I'm sure the list is, is much longer than that. So there's a need for what is taking place there. However, uh, what takes place there is, frankly, keeping people alive. Uh, it is not solving the problem of being homeless without a home. Uh, it is merely the response to that problem. Uh, and I wish I had 
the ability to share with you what we can do to solve that problem, I don't know what that is. And as a city councilor, as a human being, that frustrates me to no end because I like to solve problems. We're not solving problems there. We're keeping people alive, and that's, that's uh, a noble quest. We need to do that. That being said, as we continue to, to do what we do, which I think is more than some places, maybe not enough in the eyes of some, um, I think there are areas for improvement. You know, the, the cities of Dover and Rochester pay more to support uh, what happens there. Uh, that's fair because of their size. But if you look at the census of the population that is there, um, it, it is not all Dover, Rochester, and Summersworth. Uh, there are other communities in Stratford County, other communities in the state, other communities in the region, and might I add just other places in the country which have people that are finding their way to the William Warming Center. All in need, certainly the service needs to be provided, but the equity of how we're paying for this is not there. Uh, it's absent. I'm not sure that we, Rochester, Summersworth, should, Dover, should share the burden of this on our own. There needs to be a greater response to this. I asked the city manager, I think it was sometime last week, uh, maybe the week before, uh, to provide me with some data about calls for service from our public safety agencies, police, fire, and EMS to the William Warming Center. Um, having been a call firefighter, I still have the scanner on at home. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's a thing. Um, and it just struck me that our emergency services are going there a lot. And the data that was provided by Chief Macklin, thank you for that, does show a marked uptick in activity this year as compared to last. I think some of that is just driven by the sheer numbers of people that are utilizing the facility. Th those numbers seem up. On a given evening, uh, there are several evenings where it's been well over 100 people staying out of the cold at the Will Inn Warming Center. That is a, a, a remarkable number and not remarkable for a good reason. It's remarkable for a lot of sad reasons. Again, to the point that we're not solving the problem. The problem is, if you will, getting worse. So it's kind of a plea that I have here tonight. If, if, if you have ideas, share them with me, share them with us, share them with the community. Uh, I, I think we need to hear them. In the meantime, I think there are some things that we can do to improve upon the current situation out on Willand Drive. You know, we hear often about we, we don't want the warming center, we don't want the, the homeless shelter, we, we don't want these in our backyard, the not in my backyard NIMBY thing that we hear every so often. And I think part of that is the outward appearance of what takes place, right? Uh, there's no question that there's increased um, criminal activity, for lack of a better way to describe it, at many of the local businesses. Um, there's trash issues that might not otherwise uh, be present. Um, one of the issues that drives me nuts, and don't ask me why it drives me nuts, is the array, a, a large amount of just abandoned shopping carts from Home Depot and Walmart and Target and Goodwill. Those are the ones I saw today, right? On any given day, drive down William Drive, Commercial Drive, Tri-City Road, uh, if you don't find a dozen shopping carts, I'll buy you lunch, right? It's that pervasive of a problem. And, and why does it bother me? Well, it's an image thing, I guess, in part. But I, I think about the businesses, and again, I know these are large box retailers, the, the Walmarts and the Targets of the world, uh, the Home Depots. But what does a shopping cart cost? I'm guessing 200, 250 bucks a piece. Those are, and you, you're missing enough of those. Next thing you know, it's kind of real money, right? Well, I've since learned that every day a representative from Target or Walmart or what have you go to the warming center and pick up their shopping carts and bring them back. Well, they're not getting reimbursed for that. They're, they're, that I'm not sure that burden should be on them. Nor should it be on our DPW staff that picks up the ones that are roadside that we might hit with a plow or what have you. So 
it's it's a burden, and I'm not sure there's a way to solve it, but it's an example of why we get this nimbyism that, that surrounds this issue. This year, for the first time ever, I've seen uh, in front of the warming center, I think there are three or four porta potties. I've asked for them to be relocated to sort of the side of the building. Uh, apparently, there's a need for them. Uh, that's not been explained to me, but if there's a need for them, uh, I'm fine with them being there, but can we relocate them to the side just to clean up the image? Again, to try to chip away at the folks in the community that don't want it there, right? Uh, simple request, I think. My last concern is, is sort of a safety concern with the numbers, right? Are we just outgrowing that space if we're over 100 people there? And, and I don't have an answer to that, and I did ask the city manager to look into that uh, from a, a safety and code compliance perspective. And although I think our code enforcement officer was involved, I took it as strange that the Dover fire chief came and did an inspection of that property. Although the city of Dover owns it, the Dover fire chief is not the authority having jurisdiction here in the city of Summersworth. So that strikes me as just odd. And I'd rather that not happen. I'd rather that someone from Summersworth police that. So a few laments, concerns, struggles. Uh, we don't fix anything unless we talk about it. So I'm talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other counselors who wish to speak tonight? Councilor Cameron and then Councilor Pepin. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, mine is more of a personal plea, I would say. Um, many of you remember Jen Soldati as being a city councilor and director of Chamber of Commerce. And if you believe in prayer, I would just ask that you say a little extra prayer for her as she's dealing with some medical, it's very serious. I saw her yesterday and I've talked to her today. So please keep her in your hearts and add a prayer for her. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Um, other counselors that wish to speak? Councillor yeah. Pepin, followed by uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you. I was going to wait for closing comments on this, but I'm going to tail on, uh, on Councillor Witham's uh, thing about the homeless, because that's what, what was what going to be my major thing tonight. Um, I've got some numbers. I added them up today w with the report that we get. Uh, for 15, for the last, from January, for the next 15 days afterwards, they give us a report of how many people are coming and where they're located from. Uh, Councilman Wortham says the numbers. Uh, there was three nights there that there were 100, and 100 people one night, 113 one another night, and 130 the next night that were in that facility. Um, the average for Dover is 42 people a night. All right, the lowest has been, it's been 18 people. In the city of Rochester, the highest suspend is is 61 people. The lowest suspend is 21 people, and the average is 38 is 38 people per night. In the city of Summersworth, the average is 16 people per night. The high is 30, and the low is seven. I scratch my head and try to figure out where our 30 people are staying during the daytime in the city of Summersworth, and I haven't figured that one out yet, which doesn't make any difference. If they're cold, they're cold, they need to come in. The other thing that bothers me about this is that Summersworth, Dover, and Rochester are, are involved in this, and we're flipping the bill, and they ask the patrons when they come in where they come from, and not everybody can give their, where they come from but these are the lists that they, they provided. Providence, Rhode Island, one. Uh, Meredith, Berwick, Portsmouth, Rollinsford, Hampton, Raymond, Keene, Milton, Kittery, and Exeter. There's 11 other communities that are contributing to the, to the Warman Shelter. I, I sit back and I will not throw a person out to, to freeze at night. Every, every life is precious. Um, and I don't expect the staff over there that run the place to do an excellent job over there to sit at the door and rather whatever the numbers are and turn around and say, sorry, I can't take you because we're gonna be overstaffed. I can't imagine going through, putting that on, that on those personnel over there. 
and us as the city of Somerset, Dover, and Rochester were doing it. I don't know what the, like Councilman Woodland says, I don't know what the answer is. I know that Commissioner McGarris has, has worked wholeheartedly trying to, to solve this problem and is getting probably nowhere. The problem is, is that if it comes up and you're asking for funds next year for the shelter, my answer is gonna be no, simply because I think we're contributing to overcrowdedness and, and, and whatever. Even though I believe every life is precious, but I, this is bigger than the sums what Dover and Rochester should be able to handle on their own. This is this has got to either go statewide, countywide, or whatever it is, but I don't think it should be left up to our communities. You've always heard the, the movie, The Field of Dreams. Well, we built it, and now we're getting they will come and they are coming. I don't blame any of these communities for sending somebody to Somerset to keep warm, and, and, I, and I don't. I mean, we do it here in the city council. We have nonprofits that, that we give money to, and then if people come in and it's in their field, we kind of ask them to go there, and, and we do it all the time. And I don't want to say that these people are bad from out of town sending them to the warm shelter because they're not. I would do the same thing if I was in their position. The problem is, is that it costs money to run this thing and we have some obligation and I think we're growing out of it and rather we put an addition on the building or whatever, it, it needs to be solved. And I, I think contributing money and trying to put a Band-Aid on something that needs a tourniquet is, is the wrong attitude to go to. So that's all I have to say right now, thank you. Thank you. Um, other counselors wishing to speak, we have Councilor Gibson, then Vincent, then uh, Parody, Catanzaro. Oh, okay, go ahead, Mr. Vincent. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Your Honor. You know, after seeing the emails, reading them, uh, I actually started thinking that uh, this is not a city or town problem. It is a county problem. Uh, and why I say that is because if they come from all different towns and cities, then the counties in the state should take care of it. So I, I called uh, Commissioner uh, McLaris, George McLaris, and had a conversation with him. And uh, he is working on trying to uh, figure another solution out. Um, you know, it goes hand in hand um, with uh, the, the county nursing home that they predicted that they were going to build a new nursing home and then take the existing nursing home uh, that they have now uh, and turn it into a shelter, which would aid the need of all the cities and towns that are in the, in the, uh, in the county, which I think is definitely a better idea. This way, uh, the funds that are given to the county from the states and city, uh, I mean, from the cities and the towns, will be uh, equal because they figure out uh, proportional-wise so how they use the system and their growth. Um, so it's just that was something interesting that he was trying to put something together. But, you know, I do agree, and I'm not against it at all. We have to help people. Um, and I think it's coming together to help people is, is a good thing. Um, but I do think that once something starts and then all of a sudden it gets going and going and going, these are some of the things that you run into. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Gibson, then uh, Councillor Parity Catanzaro, others. All right. Go ahead. Um, I have to agree with Councillor Whittem, Councillor Vincent, and also Councillor Pepin, even though, like him, my feeling is, is that you have an obligation to people and you have to fulfill it somehow. Um, one of the things that I think that we need to look at in a situation like this is um, I've actually driven, I drive Uber part-time, people to the shelter. Um, the thing that surprised me is I picked up people from the shelter, taking them to work. They have full-time jobs. They're living in a shelter. Um, I get talking to them, and what's happened is they've been priced out of their apartments. They can't afford them. 
Um, I don't know if there's a ready answer to that aspect of it, but I think that maybe one of the things that we should do as a community is look at possibly changing some of our zoning regulations to allow, uh, I don't know the right term for it, but s special development projects. Um, not a good example, but like the town, tiny house phenomena um, or barracks type buildings or something like that that you can rent to people at a very reasonable price to keep them off the street. Um, you could possibly even get uh, aid from um, service agencies to support something like that. So I think that's one of the approaches that we need to seriously look at. I know there's probably nothing we can do about the price of housing. Um, the, although I, I have a feeling that that's going to be self-adjusting because I got a feeling that the housing market's in for a rude shock here shortly because it's getting ridiculous and it has to adjust. But I don't think that's going to help in the short term or the long term for a lot of these people. So we have to look at alternatives that the community as a whole can address to try to help these people. Um, and we need to look at it on a federal level. I mean, it's ludicrous that a country as rich as the United States has small communities like the three of us having to foot the bill for um, people with no place to live. Um, I don't know if talking to our congressmen and senators would have any positive results, but we need to get this, as Councillor Pepin and Vincent had suggested, on a larger governmental scale to address. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, Councillor Parody uh, Catanzaro. Thank you, um, and thank you for raising this, Councillor Ritham. Um, it's a very important issue, and obviously we a lot of us have really strong feelings about it. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience. So I haven't been here for two years. Before that, I was on council for two years. We were talking about it then. We're still talking about it. Um, obviously, it is very important that we keep people alive, as you mentioned. Um, I, d I have volunteered in the past under when it was being run by a different organization and my experience with asking folks that question of where are you from is a lot of people interpret that a lot of different ways. Some of these people that are reporting they're from Rochester or Dover, maybe they grew up there, maybe they've lived in Summers Earth for a really long time and they got priced out of their apartment. Um, so a lot of those numbers might say one thing to us, it might mean something else to the person answering that question. Um, the calls for service, I would love to see the numbers um, that you mentioned, Councillor Witham, because the, um, in our emails that we've gotten recently, the last couple of times, they've mentioned one call for service that night. There was one call for service one night and one call for service the other night. And there are a lot of calls of service every night. Um, so I'd want to know what those numbers actually are. Um, I don't know if, um, Mr. Manager, you can speak to that or provide those numbers. I was going to put that in the Public Safety Committee packet uh, as a report out from the police department. But I can, uh, um, you know, certainly send them out in advance. So the packet goes out in advance available to all the counselors. If that works for you, or I can send them tomorrow. Whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, I think it's really important. Um, when we're talking about vulnerable communities that, you know, we have the facts and we're not running out of motion. Um, I appreciated your comment about some of your experiences with um, folks that have full-time jobs and they just can't afford a place to live. Um, it's really important to make sure we're talking with dignity. Um, and perhaps as a way to shepherd us towards some action, um, I know there was a homelessness task force 
certainly the housing uh, task force. It's been mentioned zoning. I think there is something we can do, certainly um, not enough to drive down housing costs very significantly, but there's always something that we can do to help um, aid in development. Um, but having a meeting of stakeholders, the, the people that actually work with this population, the experts, um, our public safety officials who get called there, some of the other Tri-City people, you know, could we get some of the federal delegation to show up? I'm sure they would be interested in talking about solutions about this issue. Um, I will leave it up to the mayor to um, have ideas on how to talk about this, but I think it's really important that it be raised and that it move forward with action on some, um, with some more details and data. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other comments by councilors tonight? Yes, Councilor Rhythm. Yeah, just to share publicly, uh, just so we're all on the same page, I do have that, that memo in front of us, uh, in front of me here. Um, I asked for a period comparison, uh, and the police chief provided the comparison on November 1st, 2022 through uh, January 16th, 2023. Uh, in the same period, November 1st, 2023 through January 16th, 2024. So a comparison of same time period last year to this year. Now what, what's absent from that is how many times was it open uh, last year versus this year? Uh, I, I don't have that metric, right, which would be important to the conversation. But uh, for the period last year, uh, there were 16 responses, and the chief breaks it out between fire, police, EMS, or combined. Uh, in the same period this year, it's up to 25 responses, so significantly higher. Um, and uh, in general, and we found this with other uh, data sets, uh, depending on who was running the shelter, uh, they did not always, most often, did not align with our public safety numbers. They were often different, so uh, that trend is the same. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments by counselors? Tonight. Yes, Councillor. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Messier. Thank you. Um, the warming center. I've driven by a few times. I stopped in. The carts are an issue. I don't know how we can educate at least some of them people if they're going to take the car. There needs to be some self-worth by them. They can't be expecting other people to do everything for them, i.e., they stole the carts from a parking lot and they left it. They could the next day. They're not going anywhere, probably back to that. They could bring it back, but they choose not to because somebody else will take care of it for them. The same if we get some housing. I was on some sort of housing authority and you'd be surprised how many people get themselves evicted from that. So if government, if some people think government's role or responsibility is to give them free housing, there's no, there's no teaching, there's nothing. They're just gonna be accepting of everything, it's gonna be a handout, and that is not how I brought my children up. I had paper roots at a young age. I mean, I don't know to me, it's, a, it's unsustainable what kind of models we may try to create. Um, I understand that there are some people that need that because they're living in the woods, living in a tent. What has become the warming center is a dumping ground for other communities. Portsmouth Regional Hospital telling some of their patients Go to Somersworth. They give them a ride. It's easier for them to pay for the ride than let them stay in the emergency room. So here we go. We're going to get some of them. Rochester Hospital. Can't say much about the Rochester Church property in that because they're at least a major participant in trying to fix this. The county was supposed to help us correct this and Part of the three-pronged thing was to build a new Riverside rest home, and that went down in flame. So I don't know what's going to go on, but as a comment was made next fall when this vote comes up, I don't know. 
I, it's an industrial pie where there is better at, I mean, this industry was trying to attract this to help the, the tax base of this community. It's not going to be overwhelming to see the homeless center with porta potties. There's not four, I believe there's seven or eight. I went there one morning, went in. The front of the building was just a mess. You know, I guess the tenants just, it's easy instead of using a trash can, just throw it on the ground. Um, back to the card issue. I mean, shouldn't we at least be training and educating? Because a major component I'm guarant or predicting from some of these repeat offenders is they're not, it's, it's an educational thing, whether it's mental disorders or whatever they may have. I'm not saying all of them have them, but, but there are some. Um, drug issues, everything that's been said. I just don't think it's a sustainable situation at that warming center. We went from maybe 60 last year, top number, and we're at over 130, 100, which there's got to be a safety concern there. So I have concerns. I'm not happy about it. I stopped in. I think the volunteer people, the group that are doing it, are doing the best they can. You know, why should it be up to that group to bring the carts back? They didn't bring them there. That's what gets me. We just want to placate these the people, and they can't even do anything for themselves. You're supposed to help them. Anyway, that's my spiel. As I told them when I left, we'll see how the vote goes next fall. Thank you, Councillor Messier. Other comments by Councillor Snipe? Uh, Councillor Goodwin. Not to belabor this, but just given all of the commentary. Um, I guess my position is uh, I would continue to support this critical service because it is something that members from our community and other communities need. Um, it isn't perfect. The drivers of the sources for this need are beyond the scope of this council to solve. Um, it is a regional and national mental health crisis, uh, addiction crisis, a housing affordability crisis, um, and we can certainly do some things within the realms of this 10 square miles to chip away at that, but we're not gonna solve it. So in some regard, fellow, fellow counselors, breathe out and know that we can't solve this, but we can within the realm of our budget and our, our town do something to uh, better the lives of folks that need their lives bettered and are, are down on uh, hard, down on hard times, um, and so I think we can simultaneously advance um, policy changes here. I think affordable housing is a great example. Zoning changes to try and uh, uh, allow for more affordable housing typologies to be built will certainly help. I'm sure there's a myriad of other solutions that we can start chipping away at. Again, it's not going to solve the issue. Um, it will help. It's the step in the right direction. It's the right thing to do, but it's not going to solve the issue. So not to just say we should accept it. I think we should work towards doing all we can, but at the same time, it's, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, carts are ugly. Well, the people probably don't have cars, and they're probably trying to bring their groceries back to, uh, you know, to the homeless shelter. So, like, you know, yeah, it's unsightly. Great. Um, I, I don't really know if there's an easy solution to that. Uh, am I concerned about burdening uh, national corporations with uh, retrieving their carts? Not really. Um, so, I, you know, let's not lose the forest for the trees here. We're providing a critical service. I think we should continue to provide that critical service while working to address the root causes to the extent we can and just accepting that we are limited and we can just do what we can. Thank you. All right, other comments by counselors. I want to keep in mind with the council that we do have special guests here tonight that need to drive home in the icy weather. So if some of these comments could wait till the final round, that would be ideal. I understand I do not want to silence you either though. So if your comments are pertinent and need to be said, please feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, 
we do have guests. Okay, thank you. All right, um, that will move us on to agenda item eight, which is communications. There are none tonight, uh, which then moves us to agenda item nine, which is presentations of petitions and disposal thereof by reference or otherwise, which we have none. Um, agenda item 10 is the mayor's report. Um, I'm gonna start off by talking about the warming shelter. <laughs> um, it actually comes at a uh, perfect time um, that you all brought this up. Thank you, Councillor Witham, for sparking this tonight. And thank you to every councillor who chimed in. I took vigorous and ample notes about your comments um, because I have a meeting with the mayors of Dover and Rochester tentatively Wednesday next week and I will be bringing these uh, concerns to them uh, during our discussions. Um, this uh, meeting was needed and necessary as I think the concerns are being felt across the three communities and I think it's a good time for us to meet and begin to plan out uh, next steps. Um, I do believe the county commissioners will also be at this meeting so we can kind of pick their brains as well for some solutions. Um, but other things I wanted to bring forward uh, that I'm looking at uh, at least out of the mayor's office, are um, funds from the opioid settlement. Uh, we had a big statewide settlement that we participated in in which uh, we have access to funds. Some of these funds, uh, I was made aware, can be utilized for affordable housing. And I think that uh, I would so appreciated the comments about housing tonight. Thank you, Councilor Gibson, for bringing those up and for others uh, for chiming in because I think that there is a way to utilize these funds to benefit this particular group. Um, uh, these funds could also be utilized for the warming shelter. I know Rochester is planning to do that with some of their opioid settlement money. Um, but I do want you to know that I'm looking at uh, ways that we can find funding sources to help um, offset some of the costs of this but also ways to mitigate um, the numbers that we are seeing at the, this shelter. Um, so that uh, kind of deep dive into how to utilize the opioid settlement funds will be uh, an agenda item at, uh, for my housing task force, which we'll hopefully be meeting within the first week of February. So keep your uh, eyes on your emails, those who are on that. Um, <clears throat> Next on my uh, mayor's report, I want to thank uh, voters and uh, for going out yesterday and voting in the New Hampshire primary. Um, turnout was record for the Republican side. Um, so thank you everybody who turned out and voted. I also really want to send a uh, big thank you to all of our election workers uh, who spent uh, long hours yesterday um, at the polling places and then long hours after polls closed to count uh, write-ins, uh, there were a large number of write-ins in yesterday's election, uh, and so they had to spend a little bit of extra time going through all those, so thank you so much. And a big shout out to uh, city staff for uh, making for a smooth and safe election. Thank you so, so much. Um, quick announcement also uh, to city councilors, we are looking to schedule our city council photo, which will be prior to our next meeting on Monday, yeah. February 5th. Uh, so please plan to arrive at council chambers on the 5th at about 6.30 so we can take our council photo. If you are already aware that you are unable to make it, please let us know so we can reschedule that as soon as possible. Um, but hopefully everyone can attend. Um, other informational items uh, for the council are that um, I wish, um, uh, and I, I imagine the city manager will speak to this as well when he gives his report, but I uh, wanted to let folks know that we have two special 2024-2025 uh, budget meetings that uh, we will be scheduling, which will be sa uh, Saturday, April 6th at 8.30, as well as another meeting that is tentative and only if needed, uh, if the budget process takes this amount of time, which will be on Monday, April 22nd at 6. Uh, but again, I know uh, City Manager Belmore will probably mention that as well, but it's good to have multiple reminders. Um, also like to note that under section 13 nominations appointments and elections I'll be appointing Ken Vincent the council rep for the traffic safety committee uh, this appointment does not require a council vote and is coming before you tonight because it was left off accidentally last meeting um, when I made my full slate of appointments uh, so he will be up before us tonight I will also be appointing councilor uh, Parity Catanzaro uh, to uh, the coast board of directors as our city council rep so thank you for stepping up to do that um, one more announcement. I'd like to announce that the mayor's office is still accepting submissions to the mayor's quarterly art show. 
Uh, again, as a reminder, four times throughout the year, <laughs> I was going to submit the yam. <laughs> we just tack it up on the wall. There, there was a banana that was taped in an art gallery as art once upon a time. That's a real thing. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> Four times throughout the year, uh, the mayor's office will display new artwork that's submitted by residents of Summersworth, uh, fruit and vegetables permitted, uh, in order to showcase the culture, talents, and creativity of our diverse community. Um, artwork can be any medium and size, as long as it will fit comfortably within the mayor's office. So please consider submitting your artwork. Um, please submit it. Uh, to my email address here at City Hall, which is mgerding, spelled G-E-R-D-I-N-G, at summersworthnh.gov. Uh, please include a name of the artist, the size of the work, so I get a good sense and the committee gets a good sense of how big it is, the medium, and the description of the piece. Uh, artworks will be judged and chosen by the Mayor's Commission for Arts and Culture, and the first round of work will go on display in the office starting on April 1st. All right. And um, my last bit for tonight is that I am very thankful uh, to have to make my first uh, proclamation as mayor. Uh, this one is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, as many may know, this fall, the Summersworth High School football team added another major achievement to their long storied record of quality play, uh, sportsmanship, and pride. As many may be aware, uh, they won their third straight uh, New Hampshire High School uh, Football Division IV state championship, making for a record third three-peat. This is the third time they've done this three-peat, which I think is phenomenal. Uh, the last time was 30 years ago, so it's about time, so thanks. Um, but this one is a testament to the hard work, uh, the dedication, and the discipline of the many student athletes on this team as well as an example of the strong leadership of their coaching staff and the team captains. Um, so congratulations to all. Uh, it was with great admiration and respect that I invite uh, any members of the Summersworth High School football team to stand right up here at this podium, please. You're gonna receive your proclamation. I'm gonna read it first and I'll be right down to hand it to you. So come on right up, right here. So you can be on camera. This is, this is a big moment, you guys. <laughs> all right, so I know. So proclamation proclaiming that tomorrow, Thursday, January 25th, 2024, will be Summersworth High School Football Day in the city of Summersworth. Uh, whereas during the 2021 football season, the Summersworth High School football team was the New Hampshire High School Division four state championships after securing a 40-13 point win over Fall Mountain. And whereas they repeated their championship win during the 2022 season, securing yet another New Hampshire High School uh, football division four state championship with a win of 14-6 over Newport High School. And whereas this season, the Summersworth High School football team beat out Newport High School again by a score of 21 to seven to win the New Hampshire High School football division four state championship on November 11th, 2023 for a third consecutive year, making this their three-peat win. Whereas this is the third time in Summersworth High School football history that such an accomplishment has been achieved, uh, the last time being 30 years ago, and whereas the hard work and dedication showed by the team and the coaches is a direct representation of true Hilltopper spirit. Now, therefore, I, Matt Gerding, Mayor of the City of Summersworth, New Hampshire, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim Thursday, January 25th, 2024, as Summersworth High School Football Day in the City of Summersworth. Thank you. I'm going to come down and shake your hands. Congratulations, everybody. Um, so with gratitude, I respectfully conclude my mayor's report for January 24th, 2024.
Um, next on our agenda is item 11, uh, which is reports of standing committees. Before I do that, if you're on the football team, you can go home. Don't stay. Yeah. Do not stay. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you guys. Um, all right. First up is our finance committee, Councillor Witham. Uh, thank you. Uh, finance committee met uh, just this past Monday uh, over in the executive conference room uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, the minutes are not done, as you might well imagine. The city clerk had a busy day yesterday, so uh, totally understandable that they are not done. Uh, so working from the agenda, and just a quick recap of the meeting, um, our first item of uh, discussion were tax-deeded properties. Uh, every year at about this time, uh, the council reviews a list of uh, properties in the city that are uh, in the rears on their property tax payments. Uh, we typically uh, take action, notify them that we're going to pursue taking the deed for those properties that uh, are in abeyance with some metrics that we've uh, established. Um, part of this process is to uh, look at properties that we do not want the city to execute taking the tax deed. This is an automatic process that takes place. Uh, the City Council, by way of vote, can opt not to take certain properties for various reasons. And uh, on this list are, are uh, some mobile homes uh, that were only a, a year or so in the, in the rears. Uh, we decline to take those typically because we end up paying the park rent, and that's not advantageous. Uh, and uh, there are some properties that have uh, waste, hazardous waste combinations thereof on them. Uh, and the city does not want to inherit that liability. So um, the good news is the list is very short this year. Uh, I think there are three or four uh, single-family homes and uh, a similar number of mobile homes. Uh, and if the track record uh, works uh, as it has in past years, um, most of these property owners, once they're notified of the city's intended actions, almost always reach out to the city and establish a payment plan. So uh, it has it is rare uh, that we would ever take a property for for this reason, but it's a process that we we go through. So um, you'll see a resolution speaking to that uh, in the coming meetings. Um, our second item of discussion was on uh, solar exemption. Uh, City Council, by way of action, a number of years ago now. Uh, passed legislation that exempts uh, solar infrastructure on buildings from being taxed here in the city of Summersworth. Unless that solar infrastructure is greater than what is needed for the particular property, um, if, if, if it were a business venture, if you will, if, if they were selling it back to, in this case, Eversource for, for, uh, for profit. Um, it's come to our attention that we need to recraft that exemption uh, to better reflect our intent. Um, and in talking with the uh, city manager and talking with our, uh, our folks that look at exemptions uh, in the tax office, uh, they've suggested that we put a monetary amount on it of $25,000. So uh, most home residential solar systems are uh, less than $25,000 in assessed valuation. Uh, so uh, they've proposed uh, using that number versus the, the logic that we articulated in the exemption. So it's a little cleaner, a little more straightforward, uh, and uh, how we would like to proceed. Understanding that uh, as this infrastructure, if it gets more expensive or less expensive, we could modify our ordinance in terms of the exemption to reflect, uh, I guess, current market uh, pricing for uh, said solar infrastructure. More to come on that. Um, we had a discussion about uh, converting our police and highway facilities off of Blackwater Road uh, from uh, propane uh, to natural gas. Uh, as you know, as part of our work with Unitil, they extended the natural gas line on Blackwater Road uh, as far as those properties. Uh, the gas lines have been brought to those properties, but there's a conversion of the equipment in those properties, the furnaces, if you will, uh, to uh, convert to natural gas. Um, uh, we uh, uh, approved moving forward with this. 
um, in both facilities um, uh, in the uh, coming months. So uh, that work is underway. Our next agenda item was capital outlay needs. Uh, city manager uh, discussed with uh, the finance committee that uh, the budget preparation for uh, the next fiscal year is underway. Uh, it's proving to be one of our more difficult uh, budgets uh, that we've ever dealt with. So we'll look forward to those discussions in the spring. Fasten your seatbelts. Uh, but the city manager is looking for ways to uh, address some cost elements in the budget and perhaps fund them with some leftover ARPA money that we have. Uh, there is a deadline on utilizing our ARPA money, so uh, the Finance Committee uh, uh, agreed with, with this. Uh, one of the items were radio system improvements for our public works and public safety. Uh, there's a need to replace the uh, so-called repeater device up at the Hilltop School. Uh, that takes the base station signal and sends it out stronger. Uh, simplistic explanation and vice versa the mobile radios are easier to get back to the base station because this repeater gives them a boost it repeats the signal if you will so uh, that as well as the uh, base station at the DPW garage is aged and doesn't work well if at all uh, so this would uh, replace that as well so it benefits public works fire police all of our, our agencies that utilize uh, radios uh, again, Finance Committee proposes uh, funding that out of our uh, uh, ARPA monies that we have uh, left over. Um, we talked about expenditures and unanticipated revenue. Obviously, we have unanticipated revenue that we've received from the sale of the police station, uh, a little less than $200,000 uh, after we paid the realtor and such. Uh, and we anticipate additional revenue uh, ultimately from the sale of the National Guard property. Uh, those monies are not uh, directed or spoken for. Uh, there will be further council action required to direct where those monies will go, uh, if anywhere. Uh, so uh, just reporting out on that. Uh, under reporting, uh, Finance Director Smith, as he typically does at the Finance Committee, uh, reviewed the year-to-date budget and where we uh, might have some concerns. It looks like, at least as of today, and again, this is doing a little bit of forecasting for the remainder of the fiscal year up through June 30th, it appears that uh, we, we might have uh, an overage in a portion of the public works budget. Uh, we had to do the emergency catch basin replacement at the corner of High and Blackwater Road which was some fifty or $60,000 contract work with SUR construction. That was not budgeted for. We utilized monies in the highway maintenance budget uh, to do that. Uh, but again, uh, uh, that's a concern. We're also watching fire overtime. Uh, I think we're aware of that with regard to uh, some staffing shortages that they had and the need to backfill those positions to maintain four on duty. Uh, looks like that might be over by a bit, but it looks like we'll be able to uh, address that with the budget as a whole. The budget as a whole looks very sound. It's just these few department lines that we're, we're watching. Uh, another one that we talked about was police overtime. Uh, that is up as a particular line, but police patrol is down because we've had several unfilled positions. So kind of a swap in the way that we use monies there. So overall, the budget looks uh, on track. We're not terribly concerned, but we are watching a few of those areas. Obviously, one of the wild cards in the mix is uh, how much snow and ice will continue to be thrown at us because every time you see the plow truck go down your road, those are dollars, right? So uh, we asked Director Babinski to talk to the folks that he knows to see if he could curtail some of this snow and ice. Uh, we'll see how lucky we are. Uh, yet a day later, that didn't happen, so we need to chat, Director. <laughs> so... Uh, That'll conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Government Operations Committee, Councillor Mishu. We have not met, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, next up is Economic Development Committee, Councillor Goodwin. <clears throat> we have not met, but we did schedule a meeting uh, for February uh, 5th, Monday, 6 p.m., prior to Council, which I believe conflicts with your photo. Um, we'll snag you quickly. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, and I would just note um, for the public, if they're interested, um, we are anticipating to have uh, 
a goal setting session in that uh, in that meeting. So if you have any uh, ideas for economic development in town that you would like the committee to consider, um, please reach out. Uh, we'd love to hear them. Great, thank you. Uh, Public Safety Committee, Councillor Pepin. I have one scheduled for February seventh at four p.m. Awesome. City Hall. Thank you. Public Works and the Environment Committee, Councillor Witham. Yeah, I'll defer to Councillor Messier, who stood in as vice chair, as I could not make that meeting. Yeah, Councillor Messier. Well, for further clarification, I'm not the vice chair, but I was told I was. It came to my attention that I am not, but I did run the meeting. All right, um, thank you. The minutes <laughs> of the meeting <laughs> for Monday, for Monday, January 22nd, for 4 p.m., have not been completed yet, per what Councillor Witham um, and Kristen is busy so so but we did approve the minutes of November 29th 23 uh, minutes we discussed item two was Eversource easement to the city boneyard or should be to where Unitil gas distribution is and uh, that was moved on for approval it has come to our attention that there may be some conflicts but that's coming up in February, and um, so we, we have plenty of time for that to get resolved. Item number three was Greenview Subdivision Road Acceptance. That is in the process. It passed through public safety. There are some third-party reviews that need to be worked out, um, some compaction issues of the top coat on the hot top, some lighting issues in that, um, but that was moved on. That will be worked out because uh, we'll take action first reading February 6th and then the second meeting in February. So I can't remember when that was. But, and uh, then we went over a list of, oh, wait a minute. Item number four, water meter replacement project updates. We're pretty good on that. The vendor that uh, is in charge of installing those meet, uh, meters is working some Saturdays. We're about on some 40 to 50% complete, letting people out there in TV land know um, that you need to address the letter about making arrangements so we can get those installed. Now that Saturdays has opened up hopefully we can get more response um, and then we had a department of public work service update um, we took no action on that um, but because there was a member not here and we wanted to discuss it with them um, and a couple of other minor miscellaneous issues so. thank you so much um, and that I believe brings us to recreation committee Councillor Cameron Thank you so much. All right, next on our agenda is um, item 12, which is reports of special committees. Are there any reports of special committees tonight? All right, seeing as there are none, I will turn it over to the city manager for his report. Thank you, Your Honor. The agenda is very light, so I'll be very brief. Uh, in my written report to council for this meeting, we have a new business item, resolution 3024 in regards to authorizing the manager to convey a distribution utility easement to public service of New Hampshire doing business as Eversource. I provided you a copy of Eversource's request as well as a draft easement deed. <laughs> I have sent the de easement deed to our city attorney to review. Uh, just note the city council has already approved easements for Unitil and consolidated communications uh, for the new Unitil natural gas facility at the former uh, so-called Turcot pit and the present uh, use by the city is its boneyard where we store um, excess uh, gravel and and, and um, curbing and whatnot uh, on informational items I did provide you a copy of the tax cap analysis for the next fiscal year that was prepared by director Smith <coughs> excuse me Apologize, excuse me. I have also sent this estimate to the school board as well as the superintendent of the school. And as Your Honor mentioned, the proposed budget review meetings Saturday, April 6th at 8.30 a.m. where we have 
our nonprofits come in and answer questions, as well as our city department heads will be available to expand upon uh, projects and any information that the council needs in the review of the budget. And as required by council rules, Your Honor is scheduled on Monday, April 22, budget meeting for council at 6 p.m. If it's, if it's required. Thank you, Your Honor. Absolutely. All right, next. Yes, go ahead. Um, I just had a question on the, um, the tax cap memo. Uh, number one, is there a way we can see this as compared to previous years? It looks to be <coughs> lower, but I wasn't positive about that. And then the, the line item D, prior April 1st to March 31st net construction value is all zeros, and that seemed odd to me. Can you speak to those? Yeah, if you look at the city charter under the uh, tax cap provisions um, that's cited in the, uh, I believe it's cited in the memo, uh, under during a revaluation, we're doing a citywide revaluation, we can't utilize that net, con net construction. We're prohibited from utilizing it, unfortunately. Thank you. All right, next up is agenda item 13, which is nominations, appointments, and elections. Under nominations, appointments, and elections, in accordance with Council Rule 17 appointments, the following are being introduced this evening and placed in nomination. Uh, Stephen Dow as an alternate member of the Conservation Commission with a term to expire February 2027, and James Sweat of, uh, as the Ward 4 Ward Clerk with a term to expire December 2025. In accordance with Council Rule 17 appointments, uh, the nominations will remain open until the next regular scheduled meeting. Um, also under nominations, appointments, and elections in accordance with Council Rule 17 appointments, following are being brought forward for appointment uh, not requiring a council vote. Uh, Councilor S. Vincent, or Kenneth, excuse me, Kenneth S. Vincent as a member of the Traffic Safety Committee. All uh, right. And that brings us to agenda item 14, uh, which is items that have been laid upon the table. We have none tonight, which brings us to 15, which is unfinished business. Uh, we have resolution tonight, uh, resolution 2924. Uh, the chair recognizes the clerk for a second reading on resolution 2924, uh, which is, if approved, will award the city with uh, $9,249 to prevent preserve and digitally scan marriage, birth, and death, death records for the years 1938 to 1940. Clerk. Resolution number 2924, to authorize the city manager to enter into a grant agreement with the New Hampshire State Library and to accept a Moose Plate grant award for vital record preservation. Thank you. Resolution 29-24, having been read a first and second time, is now open to further amendment. Is there an amendment tonight? Seeing that there is none. Um, the chair will look for a motion on resolution 29-24. Yes, Councilor Messier. I would like to move resolution 29-24. All right, Council Councilor Messier moves to adopt the resolution 29-24, seconded by Councilor Vincent. Uh, the motion for the council <coughs> is to adopt resolution 29-24. Is there discussion tonight? Councilor Goodwin. Just one question. Uh, is this part of an ongoing effort to digitize a larger set of records? I know it's only for a certain tranche of years. I will defer to the city manager. Yeah, we'll be uh, moving forward in future years to continue this process. Great. Thank you. Other discussion? All right. Seeing that there is none, uh, if you are in favor of the adoption of Resolution 29-24, you will state by saying yes. If you are not, you will state by saying no. The clerk will call the roll. <coughs> Councilor Pepin. Yes. Vincent? Yes. Gibson? Yes. Pa uh, Parody Catanzaro? Yes. Misho? Yes. Witham? Yes. Goodwin? Yes. Cameron? Yes. Messier? Yes. All right, Resolution 29-24 has been adopted. All right, next on the agenda is item 16, which is new business. Uh, we have before us uh, one resolution tonight. Um, the chair will recognize the clerk for a first reading on resolution 30-24. Resolution number 30-24, to authorize the city manager to convey a distribution utility easement to public service of New Hampshire, PSNH doing business as Eversource, January 24th, 2024. Whereas the Summersworth City Council approved an easement with Northern Utilities, Inc. doing business as Unitil on September 7, 2021 for a natural gas transmission line. And whereas Unitil needs distribution conduit 
from PSNH doing business as Eversource to support the monitoring and tracking and power needs of the new natural gas transmission line substation on city property to the former Turcot pit off Maple Street. And whereas Eversource requires an easement from the city, uh, the city off Maple Street in what is commonly referred to as the Turcot pit for the right to lay, install, maintain, replace, and remove cables, wires, and related above underground fixtures and appurtenances and lines. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Summersworth that the City Manager is authorized to convey a distribution utility easement to PSNH doing business as Eversource on city owned property commonly known as the Turcot Pit off Maple Street and to take any additional actions required to convey this easement determined to be in the best interest of the city. Sponsored by Mayor Matt Girding, approved city attorney. All right, thank you. Uh, resolution 29 24, having been read a first time, will be ref um, will actually be uh, held until next meeting. I was going to refer it, but then I realized I didn't need to. <laughs> Um, all right, that moves us to <coughs> agenda item 17, which is comments by visitors. So again, the Summersworth City Council and Mayor's Office welcomes all visitors and encourages you to voice your opinions and views at council meetings. In accordance with Council Rule 7-C, uh, a time limit of five minutes per person shall be in effect unless the council wishes uh, to suspend the rules. Speakers shall not enter into debate with any person, the mayor, council members, city manager, or department heads. Is there anyone who wishes to speak tonight? Anyone who wishes to speak? Yes, come on up. Make sure that the uh, button is pressed and the green light is on. And make sure you state your name and where you live in the city. Will do. Button's pushed, green light's on. <laughs> I think I'm good. I think you're good. Thank you. <laughs> so my name is Milena Lugo. I'm actually a resident of Dover. I am the COO of Carly's Home Team and the Executive Director of the Willen Center. I said that you lived in Rochester. I said Dover. Sorry, did I? Yes, you did. What the hell? You live in Rochester. Um, <laughs> where am I right now? Although I do <sighs> feel like we spend more time in Summersworth lately. Yes. I'm Amy Moran, CEO of Carly's Home Team and also one of the directors of the Will and Warming Center. And so we had seen um, that you guys had some questions. Oh, uh, that's never happens to me. <laughs> Um, so we just wanted to be able to kind of give you guys some face-to-face, um, -face, you know, conversation. Um, we sat, we heard some of your concerns. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is poverty isn't pretty. It's not. It's really, really hard. Um, and the fact that we are keeping anywhere between 85 and 100 and some odd people alive, mostly from the Tri-City. There is a small percentage from other places. Um, is when I hear about like the calls for service, we are receiving and pulling a lot off of your tax dollars than we're taking, okay? We are keeping people alive in some of the horrendous conditions. They have been failed by all of our school systems. They have been failed by all of the programs set into place. I have plumbers, electricians, moms, school teachers, Grandmothers, I have a 62-year-old lady who has never experienced homelessness a day in her life, and she has been priced out, and she uh, cannot get her retirement, her pensions, and everything until she hits a certain age. The sweetest woman you'll ever meet, so proud. Shopping carts, yeah, they're kind of gross, um, but... Considering how many people come in, almost all of them do go back daily. So yeah, if you come every morning when people put brought their stuff, their whole world in a shopping cart, I'm not going to educate them on how to bring it back because most likely they will do it or somebody else will do it for them. And they should have got that in our education system. They should have got it before they got to this point. Years of chronic homelessness. I have lived in Rochester for 25 years, and I can tell you I've worked in this particular thing for six, and these are Rochester, Summersworth, Dover, children. A William Allen kid who, my son is 23, and he works there, and there's a William Allen student there. There are Spalding kids, there are Dover kids, there are certificate of attendance Summersworth people there, and they have been continuously let down by us. And so it's really easy to blame them for some of those things. But if I had to lift those conditions, I'd be doing drugs too. 
and most of you would be, and everybody thinks, well, they're not housing ready, but how many of your neighbors drink or smoke or do these things? But because it's not as ugly and as visible, we seem to have a little bit of more patience with them. Some of these veterans, I have veterans, veterans, eight, eight veterans. We don't want that to happen to veterans, but if that veteran has a substance use disorder and he don't look pretty, it's a lot different. And so I urge you to actually have a conversation with some of these people. Yeah, it's, it's hard. We did not expect this, but CAP has been saying for two years, the knee wrap money, the COVID money is going away. All of these people that were in hotels, all of those calls for services that happened in hotels and in apartments and all of the evictions, we had landlords in the Tri-Cities completely take advantage of that knee wrap money and up their rent. And now it's up there. Those are, that, that's criminal behavior, right? But that isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about a lot of victims of circumstances. We know their names. Oh, granted, now that we're at close to 85, 90, I was doing really good up until about 70. So sometimes I might call Chris and Eric or vice versa. But we know their names and we have conversations with them. Um, where ultimately, again, we do not call for service very often. It is much more often that a police officer will bring a human to us than pick a human up. It is very more often that they will get discharged in paper scrubs than we will call 911 to pick them up. And we don't blast it all over the place because these people have very little left. Can we give them some dignity to not blast their private stuff all over the place? Um, porta potties, they're gone. We couldn't move them because we have to have security cameras and I don't want anybody to die in a porta potty. Um, again, she's got numbers on the calls for service, but Wentworth Douglas and Portsmouth Regional have discharged medically frail people to us. I have multiple nurses on staff and on volunteer. I have the Goodwin medical van there once to twice a week. We have volunteers in medicine treating sores, abscess. When we weren't allowed to open for three days because it was raining but not cold enough, everything that we did for frostbite, trench foot, and all of those things right back down, all the way back down, they lost everything. If you wanna know why we have the numbers, we didn't do anything last year, we didn't do anything the year before. We put people in hotels, we didn't give them any case management, and we sat back and we went, man, they keep digging themselves in a hole. But how many of you had the privilege of having support systems beyond your, even if you had natural supports. I know I have a lot of privilege and I was homeless for seven years, okay? But I know I had a sister and I had family that stepped up. A lot of these people don't. Yeah, some of them burned their bridges. And some of them are just trying, I don't even know how some of them even get up and get out the next day. And they do clean. They clean, yeah. they mop, they clean those porta potties. They, they do everything. They will wait and they'll say, Amy, what can I do to help? So yes, you showed up right before we were pushing everybody out in cold weather after we couldn't let them leave. We have to we kick them all out. For 72 hours. Right, for nine, at nine in the M, and all they did is look at us and say, are you sure you can't stay open? So right, they're not gonna get up and clean and do all those things, but they are some hardworking, amazing souls in that place. They are not just numbers, and I just, this is what was happening. We've been screaming it. I've been working in the service. We've been telling you that this was gonna happen. It's happened, it's here, and it is not gonna get any better. I'm, she's the more emotional. I'm the more factual, I guess, at this point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where that 25 responses comes from, but, I mean, if you look at it numbers-wise, you had 16 responses during that time period for 60 people. This year we've had 20, 25 is what you said, so we'll go with the 25, which is a, you're talking a 3% difference for double the amount of people. And I can tell you out of all those, if, if we have, in fact, had 25 calls, which I highly doubt, We've made eight. I have made eight phone calls to the police, 911, et cetera. All of those other calls were not made by me. They were not made by Amy. They were made by guests at the center. I want to report someone stole my stuff. I'm being harassed. All of these things, which, I mean, they're, if they want to call PD, they're entitled to do so. I'm not going to tell anyone they can't call 911 for whatever reason. That's, but that if they chose to do it, they chose to do it. 
And like I said, you're talking a 3% difference for double the amount of people. So when you look at it like that, it's, it's really not as high as it, it looks big picture. I mean, double the people, 3% difference, that's actually pretty good. Um, we also had guests that saved someone across the street from the will and in the woods. We called 911 for them, but they left property, went and saved someone's life, did compressions for 20 minutes in the woods, and we utilized PD, who was at the center for something else. And yes, I did call 911 for them because they're screaming help. I'm outside in the pouring rain. I was physically outside in the woods with people in the pouring rain, standing there talking to 911 while they were doing compressions for 20 minutes on someone who was not even staying at the Welland. So we have had an increase in calls there, but it's them helping each other in their community and people that don't want to stay at the Welland. But and then again, so there's stuff like that. There's stuff even the highest. Yes, we had that one night where we had 133 people pass through the doors. But I sign, I have everyone sign in. That does not mean I had 133 people sleep in that building. There's people that sleeps in, sleep in cars with their spouses. There's people that sleep in the parking lot with their pets. There's people that just come in and get food and say, you know what, I just want to get warm for a couple hours and then I'm going to go back in the woods. So anyone who walks through that door, I'm signing them in and I'm counting them in those numbers. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I have 100 people physically sleeping in that building. I have had nights where I did. And I've been in constant contact with the fire chiefs, the county commissioner, all these people that I'm supposed to communicate with. Um, I know there was a question of why Chief McShane was the contact. The emergency management directors are the three fire chiefs. Chief McShane was, when we started this contract, was the acting fire chief for Summersworth and Dover. So that would answer the question as to why he was there, why he was doing the inspections, because he was acting as Summersworth fire chief and Dover fire chief, which is why he has been the main contact as well as the Rochester, because every time we request to activate, we have to send permission, a request to all three of them, which at the time was only two, because Chief McShane was both Summersworth and Dover, so it was going to the two fire chiefs, the request goes out, then we hear back and it goes from there. Um, the porta potties, I know Amy touched on it. Last year they used two porta potties. This year we went to three, thank God, because we're at double the amount of people that they had. Um, just a reminder, the Willen Center has two bathrooms. So for 60 people, we have two bathrooms. One has a shower in it. We only allow one person in the bathroom at a time. So if someone's in the shower, I have one bathroom for 60 to 130 people. I had to have porta potties. It's either that or where are people going? Outside on the ground, in the parking lot. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a necessity. As far as placement of the porta potties themselves, uh, ideally, no. My, my preference wouldn't be to have them in the front of the building, but they were strategically placed there after doing a walkthrough with the fire chiefs and the Dover city manager as well as the Dover facilities manager. And I purpose, we purposely put them there because they're on two different camera views. So I can see who's coming in, who's going out. I can keep track of how long they're in there. I lock them during the day when we're not there so people can't access them when we're not there. Um, yes, ideally in the corner of the building in the parking lot was not the best place, but last year they placed them on the ground and they were tipped over. And that was a huge, that became a hazard and so it was biohazard and all this. So to avoid that, we had to use the parking spaces that we did. Again, I had the company come out and turn them, so the cameras, they're on two different camera angles, so I have two different views of what's going on and who's doing what and where. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Camera views, we doubled the porta potty from last year, the 3%. So again, I mean, we've been told by, you know, I, I understand your, your feedback may be different. We've been told by Summersworth that they're not responding as much as they have the last two years. And that, and I've had multiple conversations with them. Like when they stop, they sometimes they just stop by. They'll stop by. Hey, I'm in charge for the night. If you need anything, give us a call. Hey, guys, just stopping in to say hello. So I don't know if those are being counted in their calls, or I have no idea as far as how they run their chain of command and where that goes. That's, I mean, that's not a me thing. <laughs> um, the shopping carts again. We get those. We bring them back. Guests bring them back. And they help us all the time. When I just left there to come here, one of them was shoveling. Someone else was putting down salt. Somebody was scraping ice off the ground. I, I mean, they, they do help a lot. We have guests that will stay hours after we close and help pick up cigarette butts off the ground and all kinds of things. 
think that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, is there anyone else who would like to make public comment tonight? Anybody else who would like to make a public comment tonight? All right. Um, I'll close the public comment time. We will move on to uh, agenda item 18, which is closing comments by council members. We're going to start on uh, the at-large side tonight with Councilor Whitlam. Thank you. And I very much appreciate the detail that you provided here. Um, a bit of conflicting information and we can sort through all of that uh, to be sure. Um, and I want to be very clear, as I said in my opening comments, the need for the shelter is of utmost importance, right? Um, I, would, I would never debate that. Uh, although I can't say that I have embraced it in its current location, I have accepted it in its current location. What I can say is that there are many in the community that have either embraced or accepted it in its current location, but there are a lot of people that have not. And when I remark about shopping carts or porta potties, so that is, those are the things that people in the community remark on. Right, that talk to me about, that bother them, that it's that not in my backyard thing. And I would agree, uh, homelessness and being down in your luck, and it's not pretty, and I can appreciate all of that. A strategy to improve those things is what I'm after, right? So uh, I understand full well about the need to monitor the porta potties. Um, I, all these counselors know I take care of a ball field here in Summersworth. Uh, we had a person that died in our porta potty up there. Uh, the leg was seen sticking out of it, and when you opened the door, there was a needle in their arm, right? It's terrible. I, 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 terrible. I understand. What I want to get to is us, City of Dover, City of Rochester, the county, whomever, is to look at making this situation better. First, I'm hearing tonight, because I've wondered, what is the need for the porta potties? You've explained it. Not enough bathrooms. We need to fix that problem, right? Why are we not investing money in that to make it better, right? That, that's a shortcoming that should be brought to our attention that we should fix, right? The shopping carts. I, I get it, right? And I agree with Councilor Goodwin, right? The, the, the big box stores have enough money. They, they, they can uh, do that probably without much problem they could probably afford to lose all of them maybe that's true but that's not what all people in the community say right and for them to accept or embrace what's going on there we need to do a better job with that right and I don't have trouble with the shopping carts on the property of the warming center to be clear <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe we could tidy that up that's not the problem it's the random discarded shopping carts on commercial drive and Willand Drive and Tri-City Road and High Street and uh, they, they're just, I, I, it's not at a store and it's not at the warming center. It's like just random. I, 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 and maybe I'd deal with it better if I understood it. I don't understand it, right? And I, I struggle to understand it, right? And that's, that's Dave Witham's problem. I try to understand everything and I know I can't, but I try and it beats me up, right? So uh, accolades for what you're doing. I appreciate it. I want the community to be able to accept this better as a whole, therein lies my comments, right? And again, even though we're spending, what, 15,000 in-kind services, Dover and Rochester paying more than us, uh, it seems as though that's not enough. <laughs> and you heard me say during my finance committee report that we're heading into a difficult budget season, so it's gonna be hard to maintain that number because the problem is, is a regional problem, it's not a tri-city problem. Yes, the predominant amount of folks are from the tri-cities as you articulated, but it's a regional problem. Enough on that. Let me stick on Willand Drive, though, right? Oddly enough, right? Uh, up the road, you, if you've been down there, uh, you've seen that ground has been broken on the new Sports Dome complex just beyond the um, entertainment center uh, there, the uh, outdoor golf fun center. Thank you. Uh, 
what, what's interesting, and the, the, the hang-up that we've had there for the longest time, because you might say, why is it taken so long for them to break ground? Had nothing to do with the city of Summersworth. Zero. That was approved by the planning board, I don't know, a year plus ago? A long time ago, right? The issue has been the state of New Hampshire, Department of Transportation in this case, right? I could throw darts at the state of New Hampshire all night. It's not hard, right? Uh, tonight I'll throw it at the state of New Hampshire Department of Transportation. They require a driveway permit. You might say, why do they require a driveway permit? There's no driveway going out on Route 108, which is the state-maintained road. Well, the developer had proposed to widen the exit of Willand Drive onto Route 108 to create a more formal, dedicated right turn lane. Therein lied the trigger with the state of New Hampshire Department of Transportation. And you might as well have thrown this project into a heap of mud uh, with no shovel. It stalled this project for months and months on end. Um, I've had a conversation with Manager Belmore, my role on the planning board, that if it requires the planning board to amend the site plan approval to get rid of that darn turn lane, to get rid of this whole issue with uh, the driveway permit, uh, then so be it, right? Uh, this is so a local guy, he grew up here in Summersworth, that's building this that I think can be a very positive thing for the community. Uh, we shouldn't have the state of New Hampshire standing in the way of this project. It annoys me, right? So there's that. And the yam, I don't know, I found it in the fridge. I thought it was cool to put out. There you go. Wow. All right. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what it was. All right. Next up is Councilor Goodwin. Keep it brief. I uh, just wanted to thank you guys for your comments and insights. Um, and I guess I'll restate um, that you know uh, you have my full support to provide the service to the extent that we can. We can. We can do so. I mean, obviously, we have limitations on what we can do, but um, it's a critical service. Uh, members of my family have benefited from similar services over the years, and um, I greatly value the work you do. Um, I would, you know, I wonder, I don't have the expertise that you have. I don't think any of us on the council have that expertise. And when there's a knowledge gap, it's challenging for us. Sometimes we're, we wonder, like, what could we do? So I am not to burden you with yet another task, but if, you know, to encourage you, if you do have the bandwidth or um, have insights, we are, I think we all have open ears and inboxes as to, you know, hey, there's this great policy we heard about, send us a link, or this town's doing this, we've heard of that. I think we're all very receptive to trying to figure out ways to improve the system we have. Um, and again, you know, we don't have unlimited resources here, but certainly we, um, value the work that you're doing and want to keep um, supporting you. So thanks. Thank you. Next up, Councillor Cameron. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, ladies, for your enlightening conversation about <coughs> Will and, um, you know, you, you shared some things that we probably wouldn't have known about unless you heard some of the comments from here. And one thing that really sticks out to me in listening to what you were talking about is that that facility is probably too small that we definitely need to work on finding a better solution to this. And hopefully the county commissioners and everybody else will hopefully come up with a more suitable plan. One got shot down, but hopefully the next one will come to fruition because it certainly is needed. Um, so thank you for all you do. Um, it's very much appreciated, and I'm sure you go through some hard times over there. So thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, next up, Councillor Messier. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'll just follow up on the warming center. Thank you for enlightening me on that side of the story. I will say the day that I stopped in, the two gentlemen that were there, volunteers, were pretty good. I mean, I wasn't the happiest man, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, I still have some concerns, but we'll see how that works out. At the end of the day, we can't have 100 people living in the woods. Um, and there's just 
resources that can be used, but they're all filled. The place in Portsmouth is full. Um, so wherever else they may be, they're all full. I get all that. I, I'll leave it as that. Um, and that's all. And one thing, be careful driving home or walking to your vehicle. I fell down walking in tonight. Thanks for the safety person over there, uh, Acting Chief Delano. So. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> just <them> be <laughs> careful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, Councillor Pepin. Yes. Thank you. I hope my comments did not take be taken against you people at all because I don't know how you people do what you do. <laughs> all right. I really don't. I come from the fire service and it, I know how it is dealing with other people trying to get help and stuff like that for people that you really care about and that you're trying to give services for. My my. I don't have a problem with the homeless people. I don't have a problem with the mental health people. I don't have a problem with the vets. I think they ought to be hailed and glorified for whatever they do for us. My problem is, is that us as a society, our politicians in our society don't take care of the people that we should be taking care of, all right? And they leave it for other people to try to do it, like volunteer groups like you, or dump it on the city of Somerset, Dover, and Rochester. Your facility, I, I, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that the figures that I was giving out and the communities that I said that were sending people over, well, the word is out now. I don't know what your figures are going to be next year. I don't know if you're, that building is even going to be suitable for you next year. It probably isn't going to be. All right, where are we going to get the money? I, and I hate to put New York City, sanctuary city, all right, they have no control of the immigrants coming in or whatever, but they have to take care of them. I heard that it's over a million dollars a day. I tax, and I want to contribute, I want to fix them, I want, I want them. I want them to get the proper health though, the proper mental health, the vets need to, need to get the proper health. No one should be able to be left out in the freezing rain. I don't know how else to push this on to wherever it needs to be gone, gone to, without us turning around and say, I, I can't sacrifice the taxpayer of the city of Summerswood. Coast Plus, we don't pay them the full amount to run their service here because we don't have the money for the city of Summerswood. How are we gonna do if we don't know what this, this increase is gonna be for how many people is gonna come into it? That's what I'm trying to look at at the future. I mean, we try to pay our firefighters, our emergency personnel, our city staff, our engineers, and every, every other city employee and give them a half decent salary to keep them here. And that's a fight and try to keep the tax base so people can still live and be able to afford to live here in the city of Summersworth. So I hope to God that you don't take what I said the wrong way. And I don't blame any of the other communities for finding a warm place for the people. And I do not expect you to turn around at the door, turn around and say, sorry, we're at capacity, I have to send you away. That, I don't want to put you in that position. And, and I guess that's what's burning my, my craw, if you know what I'm trying to say. And, and that's where my statement is. It's not from the people that are in the home and shelter. I know there's all different times of different circumstances and the reason why they're there. And I don't know how to address the problem. I, it's something bigger than the city of Somerset, Dover, and Rochester can handle. And, and I guess that's my point. And I don't know how else to get the word out. I, you know, it seems to be following deaf ears in the county. It seems to be following deaf ears in, in the state. And we have all kinds of money to do political advertisement for presidents of the United States, but we can't afford to take care of the people that are inside of it. So I'm sorry, that's, that's my spiel for today. Thank you. Uh, next up, Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> and thank you for coming out and educating us. You know, there's always uh, this side of the story, that side of the story, and then the other side of the story, I like to say. Um, and it's really nice to be able to see your compassion for what you do when you stand there at that podium and talk to us because... Um, you know, I, I relate with that a lot. I'm a real good uh, judge of character for people. I was a firefighter for 30 plus years, and I was very compassionate about what I did. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. 
Uh, there's been some stuff said. I, too, am not against it. I just think that we need to <clears throat> relook at everything to kind of make it better. Uh, moving on, um, and thank you for coming out. Moving on, I had uh, one of my constituents um, ask me a question, uh, and I did get uh, an email from Ms. Mayers, uh, the planner, about signage at the um, at the plaza down here uh, that there's no internal lighting of signs. Uh, and I don't know if that's true or not. I read what she sent me, but I didn't see anything of that. And it was at the last minute. So um, I'd really like to try to address that if that's a true statement. First of all, maybe the mayor can send it out to whatever committee to see if that's a a true statement that because internal lighting of signs at that plaza would probably be a need. Um, and I understand maybe why they didn't do it because there was probably residential uh, people off to the side that didn't want to have their signs blaring. I'm not really sure, but uh, maybe we could look at that. And at the same time, and I know we're talking about money, the plaza looks terrible. It needs to have something done. It just looks like it's, it's us. That's us, the city. Let's paint it, do something with it. Maybe the mayor can send something out to one of the committees. Um, uh, it's, I'm just passing it along from one of my constituents. Uh, top of football. I love it. Congratulations, you champions. Uh, you know, I don't know all the people there, but I, knew, I do know uh, Coach Keys, who has done wonders, uh, not taking anything away from the other coaches. Uh, great, because I remember in the 80s when we won back-to-back -back championships, uh, when I was on that team, it was great. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Absolutely. Thank you. Next up, Councillor Gibson. I won't get long-winded on it, but thank you very much, ladies. I appreciate everything that you do and everything that you said tonight. Um, but you got me thinking about a few things. Um, First off, that we're in the situation that we are really shouldn't surprise anybody because I'm not a Nikki Haley supporter, but she makes a very valid point. We have old men running for president. We have old men running Congress, and somehow these people that have made a career out of being politicians and lining their pockets, we expect them to suddenly take care of problems that they've known about for the entirety of their careers. So maybe people ought to wake up and start realizing that, again, not a Nikki Haley fan, but she's right. We need a new generation of leadership in this country. And if you, as the old saying goes, if you do the same thing again and again, don't be surprised that you get the same results. And I want to thank the city officials that worked on the uh, primary. Um, I will say one thing about the primary, um, I got inundated with crud from I don't know how many different organizations that write in Joe Biden. Okay, call me um, a New Hampshire right, I guess, because that man slapped us in the face, supported the Democratic Party telling us to violate state law by moving the primary. And then he and his cronies have the audacity to tell me that I should be voting, writing him in on the ballot in the New Hampshire primary. I'm sorry. I'm a lifelong Democrat, but that just makes me sick of the whole Democratic Party. And speaking of primaries, I would like to speak to our state representatives and it seems that the state and the city support the primaries. Let's get an open primary. 
Stop this baloney of letting the parties dictate who we get to select. Um, it worked very well in Alaska. Um, got the first Democratic representative in Alaska in God only knows how long out of an open primary. And if we don't start changing the way that we elect people, we're, again, going to have the same idiots that we have now. <laughs> Um, and the comment about vets, yes, I agree. It's atrocious. Um, but again, same old, same old. Um, my brother-in-law uh, served in Vietnam, and he came home, and the Veterans Administration told him that, ah, not our problem. Um, Turns out that uh, 20, 30 years down the road, they finally admitted that the guys like him who were in the CBs, who worked the DMZ, were exposed to catastrophic levels of Agent Orange and other chemical agents that cause cancer. And we did the same thing in, a th in the Middle Eastern wars. Nobody was ready for the fact that we were going to have casualties and you had PS post-traumatic stress syndrome, you had uh, brain trauma, and all the other stuff that came out of this, and the Veterans Administration was totally unprepared for it, and basically threw a lot of these vets out on the streets, and then people are shocked by what happens. Um, maybe the mayor's meeting could talk about possibly scraping together some funds to maybe screen off where the porta toilets are at the center. That should be a relatively inexpensive thing to do, and it might take care of the complaints about people seeing them. I mean, a simple lattice work or something. Um, Okay, and the lastly, and I'm as guilty probably as the next person, um, I had a writer the other day uh, talking to me about how different America was from the rest of the world, and it made me think, and he was right, Americans have really never known sacrifice. The consequences of our actions on this country have never really come home to roost. Um, and maybe that's why we can let things like homelessness and many of the other problems that we have in this country go on. We, from the time of the Civil War onward, we have been fortunate that we've been isolated by two oceans from many of the problems around the world. And many of those problems we did cause and never had to pay the consequences of those problems. So I think it's time that we all wake up and start dealing with the problems that we have and being honest about the fact that, yes, maybe it's the greatest democracy in the world, but democracy requires responsibility, and responsibility seems to be something that's lost favor in this country. And I'll shut up now. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Councilor Parody Catanzaro. Thank you. Um, wow. How, how to follow that, um, <laughs> Americans, uh, I mean, I just have to say it depends on how you define Americans. I think black Americans, Japanese Americans, Native Americans have sacrificed quite a lot. Um, I wanted to thank, uh, obviously, uh, Amy and, I'm sorry, is it Milena? Milena. Amy and Milena, thank you so much for coming. Um, obviously just echo a thanks for everything that you do, but it's also, as you can see, very, very important for us to hear live in a meeting 
answers to some of these questions from the people that have them and know them. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I want to highlight something you mentioned, Amy, and that is the amount of tax dollars that you are saving us. Um, I worked for a time in public health and learning about community health centers and preventive care and how much, I mean, I was looking at reports with actual figures of how much tax dollars are spent on emergency room mm -hmm. services, which is the only place that people can go if they don't have insurance for preventive medicine. And then they also looked at how much does it cost us, some tax dollars, yes, and some nonprofit dollars, to provide preventive care, regardless of ability to pay, as community health centers do. And those numbers were way, way less. And so, you know, coming from a politically very conservative family where all I heard about were cutting services, it was a really big learning experience for me to see that investing in preventive services, and I think this is what Councillor Witham was getting at, how do we get there earlier in the problem to solve this? And investing in those types of preventive services and emergency services, or preventive services can really help with the emergency costs. So I really appreciate that, and I think it's a, a really good point to raise. Um, I also wanted to um, thank the clerk's office and everyone involved in the election. Um, it was a very long day. I know it was very tricky this time around with quite a lot of write-ins. Um, and just thank you so much. It was safe. I visited a few of the polling places. Everything was running really smoothly. It was great. Thank you for that. Um, the Just going back to the tax cap, if we could get um, just a comparison of previous years, um, or, or maybe it's more relevant to compare to a previous year where we can't, if we're going through an assessment, where we can't use the construction rates as is the case this year. Um, it's just helpful to see that benchmark. Um, and one thing that I've mentioned um, to, I know the city manager and to, um, uh, to the public works director, I know we have the constitutional way redesign coming up. Um, I know Councillor um, Goodwin and I have both mentioned that that crosswalk. So I'm talking about High Street as you're coming into town, Constitutional Way hits it, and then Highland goes up from there. So it's got the pawn shop there on the corner. Um, folks familiar with that corner know that there are three crosswalks there, and there's one missing on the most on the side that it would be most useful. Um, if you do the right thing and you cross those three crosswalks instead of crossing the one you're in real peril of getting hit by a car. And I believe um, somebody was very recently hit by a car in that crosswalk, just the way that traffic goes. Um, so it's something that's been raised a couple of times. I know part of it's the engineering of the water coming down that street, um, but there are certainly engineering ways around that to fix it. So just wanted to make sure that that was, uh, you know, officially on the record that that's something that we're looking at and potentially for the um, constitutional redesign that this might save us some money to do it at the same time. Um, and I want to end on love for our library. Um, for people that don't go to the library or have a library card, um, please check it out. Um, I've been uh, back into reading. You know, I go through periods of time where it's very hard to read and periods of time where suddenly I get really into books. Um, and there's a lot of books that it's hard to get. And so if you have a library card, you have access to Libby, which is an online library where there's like hundreds of thousands, probably millions of eBooks and uh, magazines and everything else. Um, and Hoopla, which is another one. You can rent movies and watch things and uh, I was requesting a book that was not available in paper form, and I was on a really long wait list on the Libby app, and they said, why don't we do an interlibrary loan request, and you'll get it in a couple of weeks instead of 12 weeks like I am on the waiting list. Um, so anyway, just I love our library. Our library is doing amazing things, and I know that we're um, looking at um, some building improvements there in the future. I just want to thank um, all the library staff for doing what they do and encourage everyone to get or renew your library card. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, next up, Councilor Mishu. Well, thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to thank the two young ladies that came in and speak to us. I really appreciate hearing your perspective and what you're doing there. It gives me a whole new, different way to look at it. And don't ever get, uh, apologize being uh, emotional. It shows me where your heart really lies. So don't worry about it. And. As far as um, 
we're going to do the best we can in helping you guys out. <laughs> and I'm sure the Tri-City area, Dover, some of the Rochester, we always step up. We will help out the best we can. My issue is at the Stratford County level. They should be helping out. I know George McLaris has been trying his best to help them. But for some reason, they keep shooting down the new facility for the Riverside Rest Home. I won't get into that because that's a whole different topic. But I know that they wanted to build the first initial one. It looked like the Taj Mahal of all facilities. Way too much money, which I agree, so they shot that down understandably. So they came back with a much drawn down version, which I like. But once again, some of them shot that down because too much money. So hopefully one of these days they can get that through and hopefully they can rehab the facility that I got now and you guys can you know, actually move in there and utilize it. But until then, I'm afraid that you guys might outgrow the facility you're at, which is not built for that. And hopefully the three mayors can get together and see if there's another facility around the area that we can actually utilize that be more comfortable for what you need it for. But just rest assured, We'll do the best we can. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, that brings us to agenda item 19, which is future agenda items. Are there any agenda items requested for future meetings? All right, seeing as there are none, I'm going to propose one, which is that we as a council body schedule a special meeting where we attend the Will and Warming Center as a body and get a tour. If that is amenable with our guests here, I would love to get that on the record and hope that maybe the city manager can send out an email in the next week or two about finding a common time for all of us to go visit. Your Honor, yes. if I may, yes. um, that would be during operations or not during operations? Ideally, I'll lean on them uh, without um, any opposition from the council, I'll invite them up to speak and I like their that. preference. Council doesn't seem to be opposed. Thank you. Come on up. So, I, I would say if we're talking the whole group, it may not be. I, I think that might be a little. I mean, there's a lot of you. I think that would be a little overwhelming mm -hmm. for absolutely some of the guests at the center. Um, I mean, I, any one of you that wants to stop by any time that we're open, you're you're more than welcome to. We've had. Some of the welfare directors have come through and just sat and talked to people or played bingo with them. Or, I mean, any time we're there, you're more than welcome to stop in at any point. Um, I, but I think if we're talking as a group, it would probably be better when we don't have people there just because yep. there's already a lot of people in the building to begin with. Certainly, I understand and it, that. I, I'm worried it would be a little overwhelming yes. for them if the, a whole group of I you show up at the same time. Anxiety. <laughs> yeah, there's everybody. <laughs> no, yes, I think that. I think it would be a little too nerve-wracking. Totally some makes of our sense. <laughs> um, we will, let's, uh, let's connect, you and I. We okay. can coordinate. And um, if it doesn't happen uh, be due to just like uh, uncertainty with weather, perhaps mm -hmm. it can happen after the shelter has officially closed for the season could be another alternative time yeah. that we all go and check it out. But I do yeah. think um, I would like us, since this was such a hot discussion item tonight, to all go and take a visit. So thank you. Yeah, or even if we did, you know, smaller groups on Absolutely. the nights that were open or when we're not open, if everyone wanted to come then, that, that, would, you know, that would work as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, um, yes, go ahead, Councilor Gibson. Um, I'm not sure if it's appropriate as on the council agenda, but um, I would like to have our road clearing policy looked at. Um, I've gotten a number of complaints about the fact that the hill isn't being, having the sidewalks maintained. And I think there should be at least, you got four streets coming down onto High Street at least one or two of those should be made accessible for pedestrians as well at least um, one of the crosswalks on uh, top of the hill should be maintained for traffic there's a lot of kids that use that street still even though there's no longer a school there based on what i'm being told um, also um, High street parking. Um, I finally got into the uh, 
I'm getting too old. I can't even remember the name of it now. The old teetotaler. Folded. Folded. Thank you. Um, and I was talking to the manager. Um, a, we have overnight parking allowed on High Street, but when they open early, uh, which they do, they oftentimes have no parking spaces in front of their business because there are people that have parked overnight on the street. And because, okay. Yeah. And following up on that, um, I don't know if there's a way to minimize it, but the intersection of uh, Washington Street and High Street at the traffic light, um, I have a rider that I carry on a regular basis through there. Um, people are stopping right in the middle of the intersection because of the lights. Uh, I should say the Berwick lights. And people, it's just totally messed up. I don't know if there's some way to address that or. Thank you. Uh, first agenda item that you propose, I'm going to refer to uh, public state or um, public works and the environment. The next two, I'm going to refer to traffic safety for when they meet next. I think those committees would be best suited to address those. But thank you for raising them tonight. I appreciate it. All right. If there are no other agenda items to bring forward, we're going to move to uh, number 20, which is non-public sessions. There are none tonight, which brings us to our last agenda item, which is adjournment. Councillor Pepin moves that the city stands in adjournment until the next regular scheduled meeting, seconded by Councillor Witham. Question before the council, is adjournment? If you are in favor, you will state by saying aye. If you are opposed, you will state by saying nay. Aye. All right. Aye. aye. Oh. Uh, those opposed, we got one. Council stand in adjournment.